A prominent human rights expert says that Cambodia's ruling CPP party's recent move to add people from the security forces into its central committee creates a huge conflict of interest. Brad Adams, director for Asia at Human Rights Watch, told VOA recently that he's further concerned that the opposition CNRP's party's lack of clear policy positions will further undermine its ability to pressure the CPP for effective reforms. VOA's Dan Stroxenet spoke with Brad Adams in Washington about the issues surrounding those reforms. Welcome to VOA, Mr. Brad Adams. Thank you. Uh, recently, during its three-day congressional meeting, the ruling um, Cambodian People Party added new members, yes. including army commanders and some of the top leader sons, into the Central Committee. What, will you, what would you expect to see from this internal reform? Well, I don't think it's been a reform process. I think what's happening is that Hun Sen and the senior leadership want to bring more people under the CPP tent officially to give them uh, official positions so that they are sure of their loyalty to the party. And we have been critical of the fact that uh, more than 80 people who are in the security forces were part of this. And this is uh, tripling the number of people from the security forces who are in the central committee of the CPP. I mean, already we've had the head of the army and the, the top leadership of the army, Sao Saka uh, from the gendarmerie, the police. They've already you know, long been uh, CPP members and CPP officials. But having so many security force officials as a member of a party uh, creates a huge conflict of interest. They should be loyal to the state. They should represent the interests of the state and they should protect all people, regardless of political affiliation, in the same way. What we've seen in recent months, well actually for many years, but we saw after the 2013 elections, is that uh, officials in the army, for instance, Parachute Regiment 911, uh, in Hun Sen's uh, bodyguard unit, in the gendarmerie, and the police make public statements talking about opposition protesters as the enemy, for example. If you're in law enforcement, or if you're in the security forces, you can't see people who are protesting, uh, exercising their basic rights as an enemy. They are citizens of the country. They deserve the same protection as if a CPP rally was being held. No more, no less. And so this calls into question whether or not security forces can be uh, expected to uh, serve the nation as opposed to a political party. And that's very problematic. Mm -hmm. And as you might know, you know, in Cambodia today, there are increasing demand from the grassroots for the top government to tackle corruption, you know, and uh, prevent the natural resource exploitation. And in that sense, it's very Im important to achieve effective reforms. Mm -hmm. Can you pinpoint in what ways the ruling CPP and also the opposition, opposition CNRP can work together toward achieving effective reforms? Well. I'm afraid that the CNRP doesn't have a lot of role in achieving reforms. What they can do is they can raise issues and they can participate in parliamentary committees, but really the government is run by the CPP only. And so uh, the most they can do is put the CPP under some pressure. What the CPP can do um, is, some of it is very simple. There is a law on the disclosure of assets. In most countries, this means that officials, so this would be government ministers, members of parliament, uh, judges, other people involved in senior positions in government will publicly disclose their assets. One of the things that many Camb Cambodian people say is, how do these people get so rich? If you look at a lot of these people, they've only had government <laughs> positions. Hun Sen, the Prime Minister being one, for example, other ministers, they've been in uh, government all of their adult lives. How did they have so much money? Because if you add up all the money they've made from their jobs, it doesn't add up enough to enough to even buy their house, much less the cars and sending their kids overseas for school. So people want to know, where is that money from? And a public disclosure uh, law on assets would be a major step forward. Right now what we have is an asset disclosure law that makes it a crime to publicly disclose what the assets are. So everybody has to fill out a form saying what their assets are, but then they hand it into the Anti-Corruption Commission, which keeps it locked and sealed away from public eyes. So that would be one big step forward. Another would be to actually uh, bring some cases uh, for, of corruption against senior officials in the CPP. Senior officials. Uh, just like we're seeing now in China, for example. 
the new Chinese president is bringing cases against very senior officials, uh, including the head of public security in China, former ministers, um, and that's telling the public in China that he's serious. We had never seen that happen in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. Do you think going after the senior official by, you know, based on the judicial system, while the judicial system in Cambodia, you know, was really bad, as you may know, is um, the best option that Cambodia could have? Well, you've, you've made a very good point. There's an inconsistency in my suggestion because uh, any cases that are brought would have to be brought before the Cambodian courts, which are heavily politicized. And so if we want to respect the rights of the accused, which is just as important as fighting corruption, then anybody accused by the CPP or by the government of corruption would be in a politicized court system. So what has happened in other countries when they haven't been able to reform the entire uh, judicial system is they've set up special courts for corruption cases. I think it's possible for Cambodia to have a special court system for corruption cases where the judges have exercised more independence. I would suggest there'd be a role for donors, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, in overseeing those courts to make them work efficiently and be different than the normal courts. I, I agree with you. If somebody's accused of corruption and sent to the Phnom Penh Municipal Court, that judge is going to get an order from the CPP or from a minister to find the person guilty or innocent. And we know from judges speaking to them directly that they feel like they have to follow those orders. They can't just say, no, I'm going to follow the evidence. They do what they're told. Yeah, uh, for my last question, you know, given the rising number of active and enthusiastic of young Cambodians demand for social and political change, and you have, you know, uh, de uh, devoted many years working to improve human rights situation and democracy in Cambodia. Mm -hmm. How optimistic are you for change in Cambodia, say, in the next 10 years? I'm very optimistic that the public will work for change. Um, Cambodia is not the same place it was when I first moved there in 1993. Uh, when I arrived in 1993, most young people had no access to outside information. Education levels were low, literacy levels were low, the school system was broken. This was the fault of the Khmer Rouge uh, primarily, but also the government that existed after the Khmer Rouge. Things have changed dramatically. People have access to information. They know what's going on in the world. Uh, you know, if I have a problem with my computer, I'd be just as happy to take it to Cambodia as I would to Apple headquarters in California to get it fixed. They know, they know how to do these things. Human capital now really exists in Cambodia. People can't any longer say, oh, there aren't enough capable people in Cambodia to run a government or to run a ministry or run companies. Uh, there's no lack of ability and there's no lack of awareness. So I do think that there will be pressure on whoever is in government. And I, you know, I think that the opposition actually has to improve its, its performance. Uh, it's not just the government has to improve. We don't know what the opposition stands for in so many areas. They need to articulate a plan. Why should all these young people with all their enthusiasm support Sam Renzi or the CNRP? What will they do that's different? Now, most people think that, well, it just can't get worse than the CPP. We'll support the opposition just because they're not the government. But I don't think that's a very, that's not a positive message. I, I'd love to hear from the CNRP what, what they think about the IT industry. What are they going to do on fisheries? What are they going to do on um, land preservation? How are they going to deal with the competing demands for people for economic development? And, uh, and environmental protection. How, how are they going to revise the criminal law? How are they going to protect freedom of speech? Uh, how are they going to invigorate the NGO sector? Uh, how are they going to protect civil society? What are they going to do about corruption specifically? You know, because they come to power the next day, they're still going to have the CPP judges in place. How are they going to deal with that in a sensible way? They can't fire them all overnight. At the, at the same time, you can't expect people overnight to switch their allegiance. I, we, we need to hear more from the CPP about, uh, for, from the CNRP about that than just talking about winning the next election. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Brad Adams. Akun <laughs>